I'm Elizabeth McNeese. I am managing partner to Echo Productions uh, with my husband, Mike McNeese, who's a DP director. Uh, my background is in producing. Uh, that's where I've always been. I started as a PA and kind of worked my way up from there. Uh, I was drawn to producing because I like logistics. I like managing people. I like making sure things get done efficiently and correctly. And so that's just kind of where I've stuck you know, all these years. Um, before going and partnering with my husband, I was running One Create Studios, which is a commercial studio here in town. Um, so I do have some studio experience as well. Um, and that's, that's me. So here's Barry. Here's Barry. Um, Barry Zeidman, um, uh, freelance line producer, agency producer, have a production company like everybody else. Um, been doing this for a couple weeks now, and um, you know, I think I'm gonna learn a, a little bit, hopefully, uh, you know, as, as I continue with my career. Uh, my name is Phil Weldley. Um, I actually started working for producers straight out of college. Um, I did the go out to Hollywood and play that game uh, for almost 10 years and worked for some television and film producers, moved back to Ohio, worked in print production, producing print material, and then went over into uh, TV ads with the Strategy Group, which is uh, specializing in political advertising. They're up in Delaware, Ohio, and then recently got into the freelance business of producing, so happy to be here. Hi, I'm Carrie O'Reilly. Um, I'm primarily a feature film producer and line producer. Uh, I'm a member of the DGA and the Producers Guild of America. I occasionally do commercials in the area, being one of the few DGA people in the state. I get wrangled into that occasionally. Um, I like to define what I do as I'm the spend the money producer, not the find the money producer. Uh, so what I do is a lot like being the general contractor for a uh, feature film production. A little closer. A little closer. There we go. Yeah, I was going to say, can I've never here? been accused of not <laughs> talking loud enough. It's a first. Okay, so let's start because I think we have a very mixed audience and I don't know everyone's backgrounds, so we're going to start very basic. Um, in your own words, what, what is a producer? What do you do? Barry, you can start. Uh-oh. Um, well, like Carrie said, um, um, spend the money, not obviously not find the money. Um, project manager, you know, hand holder. Um, take a project from uh, storyboard, from concept, all the way through execution. Um, in my case, I work uh, both on the uh, production side and post side for producing. Um, just being the, the, the person in charge of production. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Um, it's. Uh, particularly coming from the political world, um, it's a it is a much smaller universe. So, what a producer in that universe meant was concepting the idea, sometimes writing the copy, um, being out on the shoot and producing the shoot, and sometimes even directing, um, putting all the pieces together. Um, you know, working with just a small team to really put all the pieces together, and then, as Barry also said being in the you know in the edit suite in post and just making sure that again that that vision that started either in your own mind or from someone else's page is really what's coming out at the end and also making sure people are fed quite a bit <laughs> Absolutely. very important always always um really to me producing is is you are the person who always has to answer the phone and deal with it and for what I do on on features, it's a little bit, like I inherit a project about the time that they're sometimes beginning to look for money, sometimes it's once they have funding and they know they're gonna film and they want someone to do a budget and a schedule, um, but then I carry it all the way through the life of the film as it gets released. 
so I'm involved with um, submitting the final incentive paperwork when we're doing a project that has tax incentives. I'm involved with the legal delivery, like making sure the credits are correct, things like that. The producer's just, it's basically the parent of, the, of whatever production it is the entire way through. And even when you're really angry at the project, you have to continue to be there and to pr creatively protect it and sometimes financially protect it. That's that's the job of the producer, and there there are all sorts of different types of producers, but they all feed that same goal. Well, feeding off of that thought, so there's a lot of different terminology when it comes to producing. You have your producers, your line producers, production coordinators. What are the differences um, between the different roles? Because I think a lot of times, especially, you know depending on the budget and the size and the type of project it is, you might be doing the same thing, but have a different name. Can you? Okay. I think you're absolutely right about that. In the commercial world, which is where I live, um, the budget determines everything, uh, specifically staffing. Um, there are times on small jobs, like, like you say, I'm everything including craft service. Um, don't like doing that. Crew doesn't like it when I do that. But, um, on, let's say, reasonable jobs, um, you know, filling out the production department and staffing it with people who know what they're doing and who you can trust and who are competent and know what their jobs are. Um, and I'm not saying that in terms of, you know, don't cross this line, that's the production coordinator doesn't do this or a uh, line producer doesn't do that. I think it's more a matter of being able to, you're a coordinator and, and for whatever reason, if you need to step in for, to make phone calls as a production manager and take on that role, in my world you do it. Um, I think in Carrie's world it's probably quite a bit different. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. I, I still do a lot of it. <laughs> but hopefully, you're, again, your staffing is such that you, you have the depth that people can, can be a little bit more um, specialized. In the commercial world in Ohio, you gotta wear many hats. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree, and I feel like this is gonna be a trend of me just agreeing with Barry all day. Um, the that never <laughs> happens for <laughs> anything. Um, definitely the, the, you know, in the commercial producing smaller, you know, central Ohio markets, um, a, a producer on set to me is just co kind of everything. Um, you're co wardrobe, you're co helping, you know, determine what makeup is application is going to be the best, you know, working with the DP kind of co directing what the shots are going to be. Um, you might be the one who has to sit down and do the interview. If you've got an interview subject, um, you know, producing on a, on a small, and again, if you have the budget to sort of increase the number of crew you can have, definitely takes a load off. Um, but a lot of times going into it, you may just already know that you're going to be doing many things um, that otherwise, like a larger production, might have the ability to be specialized. So along that line, what are some key traits you think make a good producer? And is there a certain background to lead up to that? Carrie? You know, uh, producers can come from anywhere. And, you know, my, my personal path was I came up, I, I worked in pretty much all the different departments, but I came up primarily as a production coordinator. And then I came into being um, a production manager and then a line producer and then a producer producer. Um, and it's hard to say. It's more. It's more something that you that finds you, I guess, is, is more than something that you aspire to do. Or if you aspire to do it, it's not what you think. It's not what you think it's going to be when you start out to do it. As is true with many of these things. Um, I mean, it, it's hard. You just you just know if you have the traits to do it or not. I mean, the hours are really insane, and one of the things I struggle with, as a lot of people in our position do, is being able to disconnect from your shows to have a personal life. So being able to be so 
doggedly protective of your project. And when you're on, for me, I only, I try to only take two movies a year because of this. Because when I'm on a job, it is a 24-7, all-encompassing thing. So as a, as a personality trait, you have to have the ability to do that. But to have any sort of longevity or career or not have burnout, you have to have the ability to turn that off as well. It, it's tough. Um, but that's, that's the primary. Th for me, that's the primary thing. Um, you also have to know how to, how to live as a freelancer. And I think that's true across a number of, of the things that have been discussed on the panels today is, you know, I, can, I make the joke all the time when I talk to film schools is I can usually tell if somebody's going to make it in the film industry more from like what their, what their credit report probably looks like than what their resume looks like. Because you have to have the discipline and the planning ability to run your life in such a way that you can handle the fact that your income is never going to be steady. Um, that it, it seems like it should be like oh you should be good at math you should be good at math you know oh you should be able to understand different personalities and work with them of course you you have to know that as well but really it's it's the ability to live and work as a freelancer that i think is, is one of the most important traits you need to be able to do this long term so how do you get your work just in this particular market how, how do you guys find your work um in my case, uh, a lot of times it seems the work finds me. Um, it's all relationships. I have ongoing clients. <laughs> um, uh, and I think my main skill is that I, um, I can trick people into thinking I know what I'm doing. Kevin agrees. Um, that, um, I mean, yeah, obviously you have to network, of course. But um, I do think that I'm sure you can attest to this, that, I mean, you've been doing this in this market for a number of years, um, and you get a reputation. Hopefully, it's a good one. Um, and I'm, I'm exceptionally lucky. That's all there is to it. I'm exceptionally lucky that I stay relatively busy. Um, as a discussion with some people earlier, that uh, sometimes the... Um, the work you get isn't necessarily always the work you want, but we all have bills to pay. Uh, it would, you know, the, the the freelance joke of it's you know one for the one for the real, one for the meal. I, I kind of feel right now that'd be great you know, if it was that ratio, um, but uh, you know, it's the way it is. Yeah. I, I mean, I think just you know. Showing, showing the proof is in the pudding. I mean, making the relationships and really keeping, you know, keeping everything positive on set. I think, you know, word kind of gets around about how you operate as a manager on shoots and on set, you know, whether it's in the studio at a place like Ohio HD or, you know, other studios in town, you know, people start to remember who the, all the players are and, you know, who has those shoots that are always fun all the time and ones that are a little bit more of a struggle. Um, so I really think, you know, just relationships and word of mouth is, is a big part of the game. Yeah, I think that's true across the board, I think, in this industry, is, and, and really any industry, is that networking is the primary way you're going to get a job. Like, there are a lot of tools to get jobs, but, that you know, I've gotten jobs off of Craigslist in the past, but they're very... They're very hit or miss, and you do really have to continually. From Craigslist? When I lived in LA, oh, yeah. Okay. In LA, it's a lot better. Here, it's all wow. porn. <laughs> um, I haven't gotten any porn jobs off of Craigslist um, lately, but oh. <laughs> but that said, oh, I've brought it down to porn already. Um, that said, I I do have an agent who puts me. I, I'm represented by APA. Um, an agent is helpful at, at a certain point in your life, but primarily it, it is through networking with people in the area. Um, I work on features, so there's completion bond companies, which is really important. They give out my name a lot and, and recommend me. And, you know, I'm on, I'm, again, one of the few DGA people in the state, so sometimes I'll get a call for that. But 99% of the work that I get is from either people I know already from other shows or people that have been referred to me from somebody that I've worked with before. 
So what would you say is the most challenging thing about what we do? I mean, we, do, we wear a lot of hats. There's a lot of different things that we do depending on the shoot, depending on the industry. Um, but, you know, what's, what's, what would you think is the most challenging thing? I, I, I really think um, you're obviously relying on many, many people all to be very good at what they do in order to get the result that you had in mind for your client. Um, and, you know, a wonderful thing about Central Ohio is that a lot of these crew guys are super talented. I mean, like off the charts, really excellent and great at what they do. So you, I, I feel you've got a lot of confidence already going into a shoot that things are going to go pretty well. You know, I've, I've I've got the, the shooter who has got an eye better than anybody, and you know, the whole rest of the crew is filled out with all these amazing talents, and that just makes a producer look great. I mean, just the fact that everyone else is so good at what they do you know, sort of lifts you up as well. I think you hit on something there. I think that, um, and again, I'm coming at this from the commercial world, not the, not the feature world, but um, I think probably the most important thing is to f find people who are better at your job, at their job than you are at their job. Um, if, if I can do a, whatever that function is, if I can do that person's job better than them, then they're the wrong person. Hopefully the budget allows to hire the, the right number of people, the right caliber of people, um, to do the job. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, but that's certainly the goal. So if you have a client um, or, or even some fellow crewmates and, and an opportunity to give them a message about how to work with you or what would, what would help you do your job better, what would you tell them? What would you tell the client or what would you tell fellow crewmates? I'm not certain I understand the question. I'm sorry. If you had a message that you could give to any client or someone you're going to be working with on how to do your job better or how you can better serve them, mm -hmm. like what would you tell them? Um, I'd probably say, and I, I think this, this can come, besides applying to me, I think this applies really to any crew function or any, uh, at an agency, any, any agency uh, function. Tell me what your what you're trying to accomplish and let me either help you find the answer find the answer for you don't don't define the problem and the solution at the same time we've got a crew of experts here we got a you know a great art department great wardrobe great everything so let them do their job um, and and don't uh, if you don't like um, the lighting, you don't like the wardrobe, whatever, then come to me and let me talk to the appropriate craftsperson and find the solution from their expertise. Um, I'm not going to go to uh, a DP and suggest put the light over there. <laughs> if, 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 I, if you have to do that, that's the wrong DP. The, the right approach, I think, is we need to do something different. Let me tell you what I think we're trying to accomplish, what we need to, what we need to accomplish, and then you tell me how, how we're going to change it, how we're going to fix it. And I, I think uncertainty can be a killer in all parts of the process of production. And particularly when you're, when you're on set or when you're on the shoot, and if clients there or not, if there's uncertainty from their end of what they want, even if they're not certain, um, A, it can just eat up a ton of time, which in the production game is time is money, right? Every, you know, if people are standing around and you're not filming something, that's probably a bit of a problem that you have going on. And I think that you know part of part of what you're doing as a producer, whether in pre-production or on set, is that you're also sort of a salesperson. You know, you've got to almost give back the confidence to the client that 
their idea is solid and the the sh the material that you're getting is is going to be equally exactly what they want. Um, so there's there's a little bit of that sort of salesman built into you know just continually giving them positive reinforcement, positive feedback that you know you're they're going to get what they need. I think going to that a crew a crew smells fear. Um, yeah. and, and they smell, you know, and, and if you've got a, a competent crew, and let's hope you do, um, they've been around good production, they've been around bad production, and when a producer doesn't know uh, what the hell they're trying to accomplish, the crew instantly knows this, and they lose respect for you, and they won't, they can't give you what you need if you can't articulate what that is, if you don't know what that is. I think clients pick up on that too. Absolutely. And they may absolutely. not understand oh, what makes the set uncomfortable or where that uncertainty is coming mm -hmm. from, but I think I think that's where being a strong producer is essential. Yes. You know, being able to stand your ground, always being able to have a strong shoulder and <laughs> you know, we're problem solvers. Uh, what do you think the ratio of problem solving on set uh, versus coordinating? What, what do you think the ratio is between those two for your job? Um, <laughs> I think, it, I, think it, I, think it, I think it. I think it depends on the project. Depends on the job. Um, I mean, there, as, as far as problem solving, I don't know if I wouldn't really, hopefully, view it as problem solving as much as there are decisions that you have to make on the fly. Yeah. But I think that with experience, you anticipate these things. You've had these. You know, you've had these things come up before. They're going to come up again, and it just becomes a matter of, yeah, I can handle that. And going back to what you're saying about clients and the confidence that they hopefully have, um, they they can tell, okay, oh, we're making it. I'm 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 comfortable with that decision. I'm confident that Barry has been in this situation or something similar before, so I'm in good hands. We do this all the time, and. Um, clients don't. They, um, you know, every time that that we're on set, we always are making decisions. We're always coming up with answers. When I, you know, I say on the fly, but it's it's more a matter of these are decisions that you make on set. It's it's normal. It's natural. This is what happens. And if the client, um, in the case of uh, spot work, and again, I, I'm going to turn this over to you in the world of feature stuff, but if, if the client has confidence that I, I've been there and done that, and yeah, you know, we're making a decision, but that's what we do. Okay, we'll do this, 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 and this. Next, um, they can smell that, and that's, if, if you lose the confidence of the client or confidence of the crew, um, you're screwed. I'd love to hear your your reaction to that on the feature side. Yeah, Could I mean, you, it, do you it, work with with directors that are, and, and you know, it starts from the top down. Do you, I don't I don't know exactly the the scope of talent of of experience, not talent of experience that you work with, and I think with probably with young it directors, varies, yeah. with young directors, it's critical that they surround themselves with a really strong crew. Well, and and that's the big part of what I, uh, that's one of my most important jobs is sort of putting the band together. And it varies on every movie and every movie has different requirements for it. And commercials as well, every commercial has different requirements. You don't always hire the same crew because they're not right for the project that you're working on. You know, for directors, for clients, for agent agency folks, it, it, it all does come down to a lot of you know, how well have you planned what you're trying to do and identified it for yourself and how well have you communicated that to the team who is there to help you. Everybody wants to have a good shoot. Nobody wants to come and have it all go badly quickly and have everybody mad at each other. Um, so the more you can sort of get everybody as a producer or line producer, the more that you can get everybody sort of on the same page as early in the process as you can, the likelihood that you'll have time and resources to really have the time you need to make sure things are right. 
and and also to allow for some spontaneity because which is often where the magic is it is that you know you have a plan and you know you have the time to do it if something is great happening on set and you want to and the scene is being elevated or the or things are going better than you think it is or the talent is really really good if you have a solid plan you know if you have the time to explore that a little longer or not and you also know what the core of your thing is but have the flexibility to maneuver it you know when i'm on set on a movie like i'll have several weeks of pre-production, but, you know, only so many days of the shoot. My goal always is, is that by the time we're shooting, 99% of everything is set up and I am literally on set to firefight all the stuff that doesn't go wrong or all the stuff that is going really well and we want to extend. So you can't underestimate how, how planning and all of those things go. And that's, if you're a department head on a, on a production, how you can work well with us is to sort of be on that as much as you can on the same game for your team so you can let us know in advance, like, look, this is the deal. It's going to take me two hours to get out of here but if and move on to the next setup, but this might be a day I need a day player. But an eight-hour day player, I'm going to save you this time, and that's shooting time. And it helps you spend your money creatively in the way it needs to go. So that, that planning, that communication, the more you have that when you're coming into the day, the better the day is going to go. And Carrie, since you work on features, um, is there a difference between what you do when you're working with union talent versus non-union? Yeah, I mean, across the board, yeah. I, and I also work with a lot of directors who are either you know, I like to call it like first time on the machine directors where they may have directed a $500,000 feature, but now they're doing it with the union crew. Or they may, may, may have made a small movie in Europe that was a hit at Sundance, and now they're making a movie with the, with the U.S. crew. And a lot of them are really terrified about working with unions, and they, they hear all the, oh, you can't touch anything, they'll yell at you, it'll, it'll grieve. But especially in this market that's just not true i mean what you we have to do in my position is you really have to know hey adam white you really have to know what the rules are so you know where the gray area is to work within them uh you know it's it's very it's not hard i find it much easier to work on a union shoot even on commercials um i didn't always think that was true i used to be very scared of it as well but once you realize that the unions give everybody a framework to understand whose job is what and how it's going to work and like why we break for lunch at a certain time. It, it does make it much easier to work with. And, and what I tell my feature directors that are scared of it and sometimes my producers that are scared of it is like, look, my job is to make it so you only feel it a couple of times. I'll come to you when you're going to feel it and you just have to trust me when I say this is one of those times this is one of those times, like, I know in your last movie, you and the DP just grabbed a camera, jumped in a van, and drove off and got second unit. We can do things like that, but you, you can't do that as spontaneously. That's when you might feel it. But my job is to sort of be like, but I already have a Teamster standing by with the van, and you, the DP, and the first AC, and maybe a grip are going to come and do the shot you want to do now. And they're all standing by the van right now. That's my job. Was that a five-minute warning? What was that? No? Dance break. Ah, what time is it? Anybody? Oh, oh, we got time. Okay. Oh, nice. I didn't even see that. I'm got a light. Okay. Um, do you guys have any anecdotes or any stories from maybe when you started? Um, maybe something that went wrong. Something you learned no. from? No, never <laughs> went wrong. I think you have to have a show that goes wrong to, to, I think what it takes to be good at any job is you have to have a show that goes really well and you have to have a show that goes really wrong despite how well you think you've planned it. I think that makes, that makes everybody better at their job. You, you know, you just, sometimes there's just nothing you can do. Um, I mean, anecdotally, I'm trying to think of some things that were not big long war stories, but uh, you know, I, I think I think what you get with experience is the judgment to not let things become big shoot, like to not to be respectful of lightning, but not be terrified of moving your shoot constantly because somebody felt a raindrop. 
you know, those kind of things that you can plan and not plan and, and how do you how do you swing from you just get that with experience. And you know, people that know me from set, it's like I'm Irish, so I get like really excited about things and, and do it. It's like when I get super calm when something goes bad, when we have the big bad happen, like that's when I get the most calm and the most like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. And I think that that's why I got promoted so fast is because even when I was a coordinator, it was like when people were like, oh my God, I don't know what we should do. It was just like, I could never stand it. And I was always like, okay, fine, we're going to do this. And if you say it loudly with authority and like some conviction, usually people will follow you. And over time, if they follow you and your decisions have been at least good in the moment, then people say you're a leader. Do you feel that that's what makes producers a little bit different? Um, is that just being able to be the calm in the storm? sounds rhetorical, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. <laughs> I think having calm when there feels like trouble is brewing is helpful. However, also being able to not be calm when you need to motivate people can also be equally as helpful. Um, so can't always just be the cool guy who's sitting back, you know, making sure everything's just flying around. Um, because at some point you're going to be up against the clock or some point, you know, talent's going to want to break or talent's not showing up on time or talent's lost. And I mean, when, if you get into breaking down the million things that can go wrong, um, yes, being calm is great. Um, but there will, has to be a point where you're not really going to stay calm. It's hard to have that reputation. You know, it's you want to be the person who people want to work with, but you also want to be the kind of person that producers will hire because you're effective and you do your job. So it's constantly the line of, you know, suffer no fools but have everyone's back is sort of how, how I try to run my jobs. You know, it's like I, I'm going to be there. I'm going to – it's hard because – in features, you know, there's the above the line, below the line thing, and, and in the role of a line producer or production manager, you're sort of got a foot in both worlds. You have a fiscal responsibility to the production of the movie, but yet, you know, you're dependent on your crew. That's why they, the producers have hired you, because you know you can crew people and you know who they are, so you have to look out for the needs of, of the people that work for you. Um, and sometimes that's standing up on safety issues, for example, and just saying no. Uh, we're not doing that, not unless we have sign-off from everybody. Or sometimes with the crew, it's like, look, this is what this movie is. You signed on for it. I can't have any more complaining about this thing. We all knew what we were in for. That's what we're doing. It, it's hard to walk that line, but that's the job. Now, how often do you guys utilize a production book? And how, do, how would you define, define a production book? You mean like a, a pre-production book? Yeah. I think that's primarily for the client uh, to give them a, a hymnal to uh, kind of read along with. Um, I do my own paperwork that, for my purposes. To me, a call sheet is, um, shows a plan, um, you know, shows how, how I'm approaching a day uh, in terms of, you know, who's getting see the breakdown of we're going to be here at this time and uh, here's the number of you know here's the crew I mean I I, I don't know that that pre-pro books are are I always see them on a set at the client table and they look at them and then they they, they look at them again at lunch and they have to review the storyboards um, but I at least in my case um, I, I don't refer to them really once a job is started. I mean, once I'm on the set, it's, those decisions are made. The, the art department, everybody's got their charges, and, and everybody should have the, know what the plan is and be following it. Yeah, I hate doing them. I hate doing them. I never look at them. They are necessary evil. That's why they were coordinators. They are, yeah, that is. That's why is, they're coordinators. Do the book. Yeah, it is, it is my least favorite part existence. about doing commercials. I agree. Is that right when you were doing your job of actually putting the shoot together, you're scrambling to make this book for the agency and the clients that 
you know, or that they're going to ignore, that they're gonna ignore <laughs> and that and that is actually also one of the big agency agency things, at least in my experience, is like that. Boy, that is where job justification rears its oh ugly head God. in a big way. It's like, oh, can you please change the point a of title. the font yes. or a title yes. on something? As you are like, this is awesome and all, but like, if I don't get the camera package ordered now, yep. we are not going to have a shoot. But sure, let please draw some more notes on this thing. <laughs> well, because the expectation is there that that there will be one. Yeah. Yes, and yeah, absolutely. it's interesting to hear a printed from one our and a digital one. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it, it's there, and I feel like every, at least everyone on the crew side knows that. This is not going to be adhered to. We're not. If there's a schedule in here, it's gonna. We're gonna get off the schedule. If there's shots in here, we're gonna get off. You know, it's not gonna be exactly how this idealized version of, of what the shoot was gonna be is ever I won't ever put, gonna look like. I won't put a schedule on a pre-pro yeah. book. If I have to do a schedule that the client sees, I'll do two schedules: one for the crew with times, and one for the client showing <laughs> here's what we're going to accomplish today. We'll start here, we'll end here, here are the shots in between, and if I have to, I'll show her, I'll indicate where lunch is going to be. But uh, that's about it. Any advice for anyone who thinks they might want to get into producing? I mean, I think all of us kind of stumbled into it and it found us, right? Um, but there might be some, some people out there who think they might want to do that and have what it takes. Like, what is some advice? I'll start. How about that? Great. <laughs> I think the more you can familiarize yourself with all of the different departments, the better you'll be at producing. Um, I spent some time working with cameras. I spent some time working in post-production. I spent some time as a PA, um, writing scripts, all of the different things um, I've been exposed to, just enough to be dangerous, enough to know that that's not my job, but I know what that job looks like. Um, so my advice would be familiarize yourself with everyone you might come across as much as you can at any opportunity so that you can be a better producer because it's it, the buck stops with the producer you know and if someone isn't good at their job it's going to reflect on the producer if things get off track it's going to reflect on the producer whether it's your fault or not so it's your responsibility to know what you're doing and know what everyone else is supposed to be doing as well yeah and i i think you know the for anyone who does have an interest in this line of work there there's a bit about your own personality that you really should take an introspective look at, um, particularly because you, the interaction with such a wide variety of people um, really kind of requires you to be able to speak in, not in different mannerisms, but you know how you're handling crew on set is way different than how you're gonna be speaking and interacting with a client. Um, you know, and in a totally different way, how you're if you're working in post with an editor in an edit suite, um, you know, and I, yeah, I, I definitely think keeping everybody, you know, that calmness again kind of plays into a lot of that. Um, but you know, being able to be familiar with people you may just have met, um, particularly on the crew side, goes a long way. Uh, especially if you're going to ask them to work beyond certain hours that they may have been told um, or when you're pushing lunch and these are all people that you just met and you know being you know having that ability to sort of buddy up quickly I think can make a production just be better um, you know but then at the same time you've got to have a, a great range of professionalism because you're going to be interacting with clients uh, who are going to want to see a final product You know, I, in what we do, there is so much artificiality in that you're either trying to present a product in a certain way or yourself in a certain way or, or the story you're telling in a certain way. And a lot of that is just poison for actually making something interesting and good. And, I, and one, of the, one of the things that I think helps foster a relationship where people feel that they have the space to do their best work and take chances and do it is, is that there is some degree of, of when you have a conversation with people they, they understand that they're having a genuine conversation with you like that you're put you're presenting yourself from you know for me it's always like look I've been here I've done a lot of these jobs too I don't but I also know I don't know everything which is why I've hired you to, to do it 
it's respect, it's not, there, there are, it's hierarchy like anything else, but the hierarchy isn't a status hierarchy. It's, it's just, look, this is an organizational hierarchy. And like, I think that's, that's a super important trait to have as a producer. It's like, if you're, if you're drawn to producing because you think it would be fun to be in charge and boss everybody around, you're not going to be a good producer. If you want to be a producer because you genuinely love telling stories and you've just seen so many other people do it badly and you want to, you want to help bring those things, be part of the team that's bringing them to life, then yeah, you're probably going to be a pretty good producer. Barry has no advice at all. None at all. No, I would say... I think starting as a PA, just in terms of career tra trajectory, what you said, getting, getting the ability to touch every department, to see what the difference is. I mean, I think that, I'll admit this a long time ago, the idea of, you know, what's the difference between a, a, someone in the grip department, someone in the electric department? What's the difference? There's no difference. Well, yeah, there's a difference. Um, but until you do it until you work and until you see all the various departments and understand why these why there is a division of labor why um, you know why it's important to follow protocol um, why there are rules of you know we're going to we're going we're not going to cross six hours before having a meal um, there are this goes I think back to something that you were saying about respecting the crew and um, I work all over, I travel a lot, I work all over the place, and going back to, I, I think that professional crews can tell very fast how um, experienced or knowledgeable uh, a producer is. When, they, so when I come in from out of town, um, and I, it's, it's both a compliment and an insult, the, what, quite often what I get is, you're from Ohio? Um, yeah. Like, but, but, like, you know what you're doing. It's like, thank you. Um, well, yeah, I live here because I choose to live here. I work wherever I have to work. But um, crews, I think, are professional crews are very good at at smelling indecision and and understanding that you know here's someone from out of town and I've never worked with this person before, but there's a shorthand. All crews have a shorthand. And it, you, when you do it long enough, it, you, you can tell real fast, this person knows what they're doing and this person does not. Um, and I, I think that, that that works both from my side to crews and from the crew side toward me. And being unafraid to admit what you don't know is sometimes one of the biggest signs that you actually do know what you're yes. doing. Because, you know, I, that's one of the joys of this business is that every time I go to work, I'm learning something new. I actively look for projects that, that stretch me to do it. And, you know, if I, don't have a, if I don't understand something, at least to the degree I need to, I'll just start asking questions and be like, whoa, 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 you know. I did a 3D movie when they were in Vogue, and it was like that was the first phone call. It was like 45 minutes of talking to the stereographer, just going like, so, so tell me what's important that I should know about that. What's the terminology so I'm saying this correctly when I talk to people? It's left eye, right eye? Okay, great, I get it. And, it, you know, having those conversations where you just let other people fill you in on those things is super important. And sometimes when there is a problem on a set or you, or you don't understand it, just, just being the first to say, you know, yeah, this is really a problem, isn't it? And does anybody else have an idea? Does anybody have an idea on, on this stuff? It is a good sign of leadership because it shows that, you know, you're not trying, you know, you, there's always a bit of fake it, but, because you just have to, but, you know, there's a difference between blind faking it and just, you know, demanding everybody listen and sort of, being like, yeah, it's you know, sometimes I don't know either. But Let's figure it out. That's not a sign of strength. That's yeah. not a sign of weakness. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. And and crews know when you're bullshitting them. Yeah. Um, and and saying, I've never done a 3D movie before. I need your help. Yeah. Tell me what I need to know. Um, you know, I I think that crews respect that. Yeah. And I think they'll be much more willing to help you and work with you and make sure that you don't fail. 
Yeah, because I mean, it's it's not coming from tell me what I need to know so I look good in my meeting. Right. It's tell me what I need to know so I can help you do your job. Because again, we all want this to go super, super well. That's what we all want. Everybody wants to be part of the project that goes to Sundance. Everybody wants to be part of like the really amazing commercial or even the commercial that shot a 12 hour day in eight and we all went to the bar early. You know, it's, it's the dream is well, always success. Yeah, so anything you can do to foster, let's let's get there and let's everybody have a win, the better off you're all going to be. Great. Well, we actually have seven minutes left, and since this is Scott's stage, I want to talk a little bit about rentals and gear. Um, Scott, are you listening? No, he's writing. That's okay. This is being recorded. Um, how involved are you when it comes to gear rental? I'm, I'm asking a question for you, Scott. How involved are you when it comes to gear and gear decisions and working with a rental company? Personally, I, not that much. Again, what I want to do is I hire the DP, um, and I'm, I am a, personally a big believer in um, department heads. I hire department heads. I, I don't fill out the crew. I let the, and in that same, uh, following that same path, if I'm not going to tell a DP, um, here are the lights you have to use, or here's the, you know, here's the size of the grid. You tell me. That's why I hired you. Yeah, I think yeah, that's exactly the same type of scenario. That, you know, as soon as we're talking with the DP, um, you know, I feel like that's sort of the transfer of, you know, part of what they're going to be doing is, you know, We've spoken, we've discussed sort of what the goal is going to be for the shoot. Um, you know, are we talking sort of in, you know, an on-location interview setup? Are we doing um, tabletop B-roll? You know, just you know, all that information has been communicated to the DP, and that person now should have all the information necessary to contact a rental house, also with an understanding of what a budget would be, to get all the pieces that we need, you know, without renting the entire, you know, five-ton truck. Mm -hmm. I'm usually pretty super involved in selecting the vendors. Um, I, not that I don't listen to my DPs, and not that my you know, the gaffers and key grip and the DP don't make their equipment list. They do, and a lot of the time, my vendor selection is based on what they need. Like, you know, if they if they need a certain camera, that's going to, to some degree, dictate where I rent that from. But I do have the ability to, on features more so than commercials in this particular market, we're driven very much by tax incentives. Mm -hmm. And the market that you're in and where the gear comes from is really an important, important part of the financial picture mm -hmm. of the movie. So, you know, I may say, look, I'm super open to discussing vendors, but we are required to use an in-state vendor because we need to get the tax incentive on it. Or there may be times where if you're dealing with, sometimes you have an, an experienced director and DP team that have come up together and you have to get them all on the same page and be like, look, I get why you want to use this particular camera, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to get on the phone and we're going to talk with the post-production team and let's talk about what our delivery requirements are. Because if I've got a 4K delivery, and you want to shoot on, you know, the Alexa Mini, and but I have to contractually originate in 4K, we may have a little bit of a process. Sure, I can convert. Sure, there are things I can do, but these are things that I need to be involved with to do. I mean, I know enough about that stuff to be dangerous. The little bit I know is enough to be dangerous, but I, I know I don't know everything, but I know the questions to ask. And because of that, and I know the team members to put together to have the conversation, so a lot of the times that's, that's where I come, come in as well. There's a, other, other considerations that as people come up or on a commercial that wouldn't matter, that matter more on a feature. You know, for example, if I'm dealing with a small, like, guy with a, to stay away from kids, to like a guy with a, with a lighting package, for example, and he's got 120K, it's like, okay, that's awesome. What happens when it goes down? Or, you know, it's the same with, like, a, quick, a honey wagon vendor too. That's awesome until the septic system doesn't work. And then where are we? We are in the middle of Iowa with no place to poop. 
It's just those are the kind of things you have to think about. So, so I am pretty involved in the selection of those vendors. Yeah, and I, I agree. I'm in the same boat. Um, when it comes to rentals and vendors and, and all of that, I, it's a collaborative effort, typically. Um, usually it's because I'm the one who manages the budget. And so ultimately I have to kind of guide the decision so that everybody's happy. So I have to know a little bit, again, just to be dangerous. I don't know gear well. I'm the first to admit it. But I know how to write a check. Yeah. So I have to be involved, and we'll talk through those things. And I, and, I, and I trust the people that I'm working with to know, you know their expertise. So Yeah, and that's where being a long-term participant in, in a market or with certain vendors is helpful because then you have, then you have the ability that, that your vendors are going to trust you. If you have a passion project and they don't have very much money, like I, I'm, I'm, one of my quotes that I say a lot is, you know, you can't plead poverty, then beg for credit. So it's like if I'm doing something where I know I don't have the regular rental amount, I might send over the, the camera package list and say, the DP wants this. I've got this money, but all the money I have, I'm going to give to you day one because I know you, and that may help you cash flow wise. How much on crack are we? And what, what do we need to adjust to make this work for everybody? And be like, okay, great. And then other times I'll be on a larger commercial or a bigger project and just be like, you can give me the full day rate on this one, no one's gonna care. And that's the, you know, I do that with crew as well. It's like some you do for money and some you do for love. And having a long-term ability to be the person that selects the vendor or at least hires your department heads enables you to, to have that sort of relationship. So you can do the little passion things and also pay everybody off by sometimes having a bigger thing. Uh, so we probably have uh, uh, like five more minutes time for like, if you got like two audience questions. Uh, anybody have anything out here? John. No, well, I'm curious on the pool. You know, a lot of the time you're smaller, you guys do, but what are some good rock solid pools, cloud based, whatever that you can use to gauge the scale of land, project land here that you recommend? Okay, so his question was, what are the tools that you use um, for project management or just production in general? What are some of the software or things that you use? Uh, for project management, I've used a tool of um, Rike, which is W-R-I-K-E. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's got a nice dashboard layout where you can sort of see where, where out in the process things are. And then within that folder, you can kind of lay out pretty much all your notes, scripts, who's involved, um, pretty handy. Airbnb for locations, little side thing. Airbnb is great to find a location on the fly. Very helpful. Or Turo for picture cars. That's one I just learned on the last show, which has been great. Um, you know, there are a lot of cloud-based project management software. I, I must admit, we primarily just stick with Dropbox. Um, I do most of the legal delivery for my films in Dropbox. Uh, you know, the um, networks and studios all are on, on different ones that are, I think, cost prohibitive. They're cost prohibitive for me at like $10 million. They're probably a little cost prohibitive for other people too. They work very well. They have a lot of functionality, but the price point's just not there yet. Um, but Dropbox works pretty well. For me, um, Studio Binder, Frame.io. Yeah, Frame.io. Um, Frame my Google Docs. Is I mean, how we yeah. do it all uh, now. And, and Google. I mean, everybody has a Google account, so you can. Yep. I just. I, th I think. Quite often, in my case, Google Docs is the easiest yeah, way. Yeah, I, I agree. It's just, so it's just for sharing. You yeah, know? I've used I mean, a lot of different um, platforms. Uh, you know, for bigger operations and smaller. If it works for me, we're a very small operation, um, so I actually use Google. Google Docs because you can you can create slides you can everything's integrated um, and there's some really good templates on there for project management and project tracking um, so what we do is I have a project tracker for all of our clients that then Google it, it links to the other Google Docs that are in the drive for that client so everything's all together and it's free yay yay yeah. all right hey, uh, thank you so much uh, amazing panel right maybe Woo! Look at that. They, they, they love you guys. That was amazing.